I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Frank Shamrock, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Living legend. You kind of started the sport of MMA. You and your brother, Ken, I feel really were like legends who start, who started, you know, ultimate fighting MMA. You really brought it to the public's attention. I'm sure it was around, but it wasn't popular in the early mid nineties. And then you, you were like a legend in the space. You were winning every title. I mean, how are you going down the list of titles? How many titles did you win? You were all, I think all, I won them all. Yeah. <laughs> Middleweight, <laughs> yeah. light heavyweight, <laughs> this, that. you basically like crushed everyone. And, yeah. and you did it in such a way that was very unique to you. I mean, I want to get to kind of your past, present, and future, but just the way you won, you combined so many disciplines to kind of make your own style of, of martial art, basically, that would help you, you know, you know, people probably had a hard time preparing for you um, because they didn't know which discipline you would, you know, yield against them. You could, you could kickbox them. You could like strangle them, whatever, whatever it was you were doing, there was a, I don't know how somebody would have prepared for you. Not that I'm a fighter that prepares to fight for fighters, but uh, how would somebody, how should someone have prepared for you? And then there's a lot more to discuss, like like jail and tensions and <laughs> uh, all, all of these things. And then and then I also have a confession for you, but but how would someone prepare for you? Um, well, I, I was the first super athlete and I was the first well-rounded fighter. So I was- I feel that there's not a lot of humility there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was true. Like it was, uh, uh, you know, it just happened to be that throughout that study, I became that guy. Uh -huh. So, um, but it was, uh, it was out of necessity. Like I didn't want to fight. You know what I mean? Like I, I wasn't into hurting people, but I didn't want to get hurt. So, you know, I, I took a very scholastic and a very, you know, street survival approach to learning martial arts. Because to me, like, I was fighting professionally, but I was trying not to get killed. Like I was trying not to get hurt. So to me, like the whole system was what Bruce Lee talked about, do the most amount of damage with the least amount of effort and the least amount of damage done to yourself. Wait, so do the most amount of damage with the, <laughs> the least, least amount, amount of effort, effort and the least amount of damage done to yourself. And one of the arts that you did um, study and train for in order to become this all around, you know, mixed martial arts or ultimate fighting champion was Jeet Kune Do, which was Bruce Lee's yeah. art form. What makes... I feel like, was that a real martial art or was it just something that he kind of had developed and popularized? Like, was that, uh, you know, something real? 
It was real in that on his journey, he, he, you know, created it. So it was as real as he could contact and commit to and, you know what I mean, being who he was. Um, I went on the same journey, except for I went into a cage and fought. You know, um, Bruce didn't have to fight. He got to use it in theory and create a system that was mainly theoretical. Um, the techniques were fantastic, and the techniques have been proven to work. Um, like, what's an example technique that was sort of new to Bruce Lee that you've been able to use successfully but wasn't really used before Bruce Lee? Uh, the I, this is off on a tangent yeah, on everything, no, no, but I'm the, just curious. Uh, the idea of, um, you know, a straight blasting, the idea of, you know, connecting straight lines I don't, well, in, what does it in mean? striking. Um, you know, you see movies and these big, wide, circular, crazy, but like, you know, haymaker punches. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the shortest path is a straight line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, a lot of the, you know, all the martial arts come from somewhere. They're made for some reason, some issue, create a martial art, kick guys off horses. Um, you know, his was just a personal study. He was on this, this journey like I was to learn about fighting. What is fighting? What is it? You know, I'm studying martial arts. What is it really? Um, and what he found out on the basis of Jeet Kune Do is, Use whatever works. And so I just took from him the philosophies mm -hmm. because the technical parts, we had already progressed further. You know, there was already better ways to maximize your body, you know, more power that can be gained. Um, so I took from him all the philosophies and stuff and all the ideas because uh, I didn't have a base. I didn't have a martial art. So, you know, when you say, how do we beat him? There was no way to beat me because there was no base. My base was whatever was needed to win. Because I've seen a, I've seen a bunch of your fights and like some some of these guys they're like they're brutal they want to come at you and just like crush you to the ground and and the way you fight them was, would be different than other people some people you're like restraining and then once they're restrained then you you do what you need to do to to beat them other people you've got to kickbox other people you've got you do all sorts of techniques to win so it's uh i mean would you say that's your school or your brand of of fighting yeah mm -hmm. my 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 style or what i presented was what bruce lee talked about mm -hmm. how do you do it the quickest most efficient most effective way without hurting yourself i like the bruce that lee quote uh I, I fear more the man who's uh studied one kick ten thousand times mm -hmm. than ten thousand kicks one time yeah. So just that idea of like uh, repetition and really learning one thing better than anyone else in the world. And then maybe going on to the next thing, but making sure you, you learn that one thing first. Yeah. And the biggest thing that I took from, from Bruce Lee was the philosophies, mm -hmm. the ideas and the theories. And what they allowed me to do was to take, you know, he was on a life journey that included all these studies. This style is his studies. I was able to take you know, all the philosophies, the ideas, the theories, the understanding of the biomechanics in the human body that he studied and take newer information, newer technologies, and just enhance it. Like, like what's an example? Um, just punching footwork, structural positions. You know, he was not a super athlete. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have those mechanics in his body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I became a 200-pound super athlete. So, okay, just by background, we're going to kind of go all over the place. You were, as a teenager to the age of 21, you were in jail for like three and a half years, right? Yep. So you must have gotten the shit kicked out of you quite a bit in jail, or you must have, or maybe not. Maybe you were in a lot of fights, but 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 you had the least amount of damage, so you could inflict the most amount of damage. Maybe, where, maybe that's how you learned to focus on that philosophy. Well, I, I, I'd be afraid to go to jail at that age I, to get beaten up. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was intimidating. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like the streets, jail is very much a... You have to fight. You know, if, if someone, you know, attempts to take your stuff or pressure you or, you know, take advantage of you, like you are obligated to fight both for yourself and then for your own race. Because if you don't fight, then your own race will come take your stuff mm. because you didn't stand up. So I see. So you, you have to fight. Then, and then at that point, you have no friends. And then you have, then you have nothing. So right. it's like you, you're obligated socially to fight if you're in that situation. Is there, uh, and I don't know anything at all, is there anything like if you fight and lose, are you still okay because you've gained some respect? Totally, yeah. You can lose and you can get your ass kicked, but you can't be a punk or you can't be, you know, somebody who does nothing. And because then you literally your own race will come take all your stuff because they'll be like, well, you have no value and, and to if, us or to yourself. Right, because you can't protect them. You can't protect us. You can't protect yourself. You can't protect us. Like, you have no value. And they would literally take your own race. will take your own stuff. 
Like what's some of your stuff that you have even? Your radio, your, you know, all your stuff, like the things you live off of, you know, your, your tiny two by two box of stuff. So they will come, you know, liberate it for you. So you get into, you, you go into jail your first day, you're a teenager. What's the first time someone challenges you, you know, is in your face? Uh, it happened in jail. Mm -hmm. Uh, it happened in jail when, um, because I was in youth jail. And then when I turned 18, they moved me straight to adult jail. Um, and day one, big giant burly dude came in and tried to take my bowl of hot chili. And that guy was like six foot five. Like just, so everyone's just sitting a, around. Everyone's sitting at a giant table in a dorm setting, minimum security. And um, this big giant man literally walks in, looks down, sees my bowl and just scoops it up and puts it in front of his. And I go, hey, that's, hey buddy, that's my bowl. And he goes, no, it's not. And I'm like, and he's literally, he's six foot five. He's 300, he's a giant man. And I'm, you know, it's an 18 year old kid at the time. Um, and I go, oh man, you must've misheard me. That, that's my bowl of chili. And he's like, no, it's not. And I know like, I have to get up and do something about this. Cause he's just trying to, you know, take my stuff. So my very first confrontation was with him. And uh, I, uh, I picked up the bowl of chili and threw it right in his face. And then when he put his hands up, I took the metal tray and started beating him over the head with it. And then after he smacked me across the room and got me to stop doing that, he came over and started pounding on me. And uh, uh, he was pounding on me and then I just looked up and there was his groin. So I attacked his groin. And when the guards came to pull him off of me, I was attached to his groin and they were dragging me across the uh, cell block as well. Oh my gosh. And from that moment on, everybody was like, hey, respect, don't mess with that guy. And so that's how I- um, That's crazy. So I got my respect in that jail. And then every- Prison is a new experience because if someone senses there's weakness or if you show weakness, you know, prison's all about not having power. They take everything away from you. They take away all your power. So everybody's struggling to gain power. And the guard, I mean, this is totally, again, naive on my part, but the guards are not in there saying, hey, break it up. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. And you, you can't tell. So whatever happens, happens. It's yeah. just, it's just it, it is what it you is. You can't say, he beat me up. <laughs> you can't tell because then you're the rat and then everybody comes for you. Mm. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough place to live, you know, especially, um, you know, coming from the streets, not having education, not having a lot of support. Um, it was the first time I woke up and was like, wow, I really screwed up my life. I got to get out of here. So, so, so yeah, so let's, so, okay. First, I want to say, um, you uh, spoke to a good friend of mine, Ryan Holiday, or, or maybe he had read something you had, you had written um, about, about this concept of learning, which you called plus minus equal, which is to, you know, find a teacher like a mentor, find people who are aspiring and rising up to, to work with, and then find people to teach. Am I, am I correct in saying that that was a message of, of yours? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I've totally stolen that. And I love given, it. Please and not use giving it. you credit <laughs> at all, but now I'm giving you credit for it completely. All right. Um, but Ryan did a very good job of giving you credit. And, um, um, but I just love that concept because there's lots of different ways you can go with that. Like, like a mentor, like a plus could be a virtual mentor, a real mentor. Like for you, Bruce Lee was a, a plus, but he was a virtual mentor. And uh, whereas your brother Ken or, or, or uh, might've been uh, a slightly older, you know, more real mentor. And, and he might've had other real mentors all, along the line. And then your equals are all the people who are also rising up, who um, are, you know, you exchange notes, you exchange ideas, you exchange techniques, and you trust them because they're you're 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 e you're all equally ambitious and, and trying. And then the minus, and now you now you run all these um, training schools and stuff. Minus, I think, helps you solidify what you're learning because if you can't explain it and teach it, you probably didn't really learn it so well. Like Bruce Lee was great at explaining things. So I just love the concept. I think that could be applied to any area of life. Yeah, so, I mean, I I do it for everything, from marriage to business to you know God questions. I do, you know, I'm, I've learned after forty four years. I don't know anything. How, how do you deal with <laughs> How do you deal with marriage? I need to learn this. Uh, I have a neighbor named mm -hmm. Les. He's been married to his wife uh, for forty seven years. Wow! And so anytime I can't figure it out, I walk over next door and knock on the door and I sit down with Les and I say, Hey, Les. And Les lays, he's got 45 years. He lays it on me. And, and then who are your equals? Um, in the marriage space, mainly just people in my community. Yeah. Because we're all sharing, you know, children and stuff yeah. like that. So uh, there's a couple of husbands that were like, you know, right here. <laughs> and, um, then, and then minus. My minus, uh, well, I have, uh, I have 
three kind of younger business professionals that I mentor. Uh -huh. And that's also like a life mentoring. Uh -huh. um, and then um, I have virtual people that I mentor kind yeah. of all over the world. So it really does apply. I, I really do believe this plus minus equals that, uh, uh, that, you, that you talk about, it really applies to every area of learning. I yeah, mean, I, I mean, find it to be incredibly useful. A thousand percent. And, and you hit it in the minus because that's really where the magic happens. You know what I mean? Nobody wants to be the minus, but if you don't know, you don't know. Well, well, somewhere, you, every plus has to, I mean, if you have a plus, that means that plus has a minus. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that is an important part of becoming the plus is being able to communicate to the minus. And it's, a, and, and it's not about an ego thing. It's not like giving it forward. It's like, oh, I didn't really learn this until I was able to explain it in a very simple way that I could understand it, that made sense to me. So I, I find it very valuable in all the things that I try to learn. So just that concept that now I can't believe now I'm talking to you because I've, <laughs> I've read it in Ryan's book. I talked about it with Ryan and uh, I think it was ego is the enemy. Um, and, and then I wrote it in one of my books and I've just kept writing about it because it's such a powerful concept. But okay, back back to you're your, your 16, you're causing trouble, you get sent to jail. Why were you causing so much trouble? Why are you such a bad kid? You know what? I, uh, by the time I was 11, I left my house and became a ward of the state. And I didn't know that the things that were going on in my house by way of punishments and stuff were abuse. I didn't. All I knew was I was an emotional basket case. I couldn't hold anything together for more than a few days. No sport, no activities, because I would just fall apart. Mm. Um, but what was happening is I was being emotionally traumatized by the abuse. Um, so when I left my home, you know, the first thing I learned was crime was a tool to get out of your home and protect you. Because mm. that's how I got out of my home and protected me. I actually threw rocks at a train. And in California, that's a felony. So the first time I was ever able to leave my home, I was 11. And I went and did 10 days in juvenile hall. Oh my gosh. And it was the first time I was away from my family. I was hanging out with all the bad kids and I was talking to them. And I'm like, man, like, well, how do you guys deal with this being locked in the closet and stuff? And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, you don't get locked in the closet. They're like, oh no, that's so horrible. And I realized and these when are the, I was these are the 11, bad kids these are the bad were, kids who were in telling, like an 11 year old jail. Yeah, telling telling me how what the bad hell? it is. <laughs> yeah. And that's when I was like, oh my God, like I, I have to leave my home. And, you know, I went and saw the counselor and she's like, well, if you keep this crime up, we're going to take you out of your home. And I was like, well, bingo. So I just kept doing it. And then they came and took me. And then when it came time, you know, the uh, counselor's like, well, you know, they'll send you home. Like, and I said, I don't want to go home. And she said, well, you got to stand up in court and say, I don't want to go home. It's, I'm doing this because I don't want to go home. And so once I did that, then boom, I was instantly awarded the state. And then the problem was I learned that crime was a tool to change my situation. Mm. So uh, when things didn't work out the next place, I'd be like, well, I know what to do. Commit a crime, go back to juvenile hall, see my friends, get a new placement. So I got in this cycle, which didn't stop until I was uh, 17 and I was married. And then because I was married and I was an emancipated minor, anything that I did illegally was charged as an adult. Wow. So, so that's when things change. You're not just going back to juvenile hall and meeting your friends. Now you're with the guy who's going to take your plate of chili, who's six foot five. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured, 
for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious, like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Now, when you were 16, you had um, a, a girlfriend and a kid, or I guess you said you got married at yeah. that age, and, and a kid. What happened? I, I, I know eventually, of course, you went to jail. All these things happened in your life. Do you, are you able to keep in touch with the kid from that age? I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. My son, little Frank, he lives across town from me. Okay. And he's now 20, or maybe 29 this year. See a big guy? <laughs> yeah, big guy, super sweet. I graduated continuation high school with him and my wife. Wow. Yeah, when I was 17 years old. So, so uh, uh, you, you get, I saw the before and after pictures. You get out of jail. You were like a big guy then. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, Bob Shamrock, who was this, you, you were staying in kind of this home for troubled kids that he was running. Um, I believe it was him who said to you with, you know, you had worked out. You were like kind of a ripped guy. He said, you're either going to be, a fighter like like Ken here, 
or you know Ken, Ken Shamrock, who is uh, uh, his, I guess, original adopted son or first adopted son, or you should be a male stripper. Yeah. <laughs> did you consider the male stripper side? <laughs> I did. I maybe spent one night thinking about it, but that was, <laughs> I was not. Uh, that was not my speed. And I but, always, I always dreamt of uh, becoming a champion. So it was one of my, you know, childhood fantasies. Stripping was not. Right. So that that makes <laughs> sense. So, but Ken at that time. Uh, I mean, maybe, I mean, I think Ken had the sense and you didn't have the sense that, oh, your fighting that you had been used to was kind of this street fighting almost style, like to protect yourself, to, to you know, cause damage without being hurt, but not necessarily yet a, a martial art because you're not learning that in, in jail. And he had been kind of in training and, it, you know, he sort of says to himself, well, I need to put this guy in his place and kind of crush him. <laughs> and so when you first kind of fought him, to kind of see what this was all about, what what happened? Well, that was we used to call it the tryout, mm -hmm. which is um, very uh, nice sounding word. Right, it sounds very you know pleasant. Uh, it's actually five hundred squats, sit ups, push ups, and leg lifts, and then you spar a professional fighter for twenty minutes. And I sparred my brother because he wanted to be the guy, and he just beat the living shit. Like I would just beat me, like it was. And you know what? I don't understand what that means. Like I don't. <laughs> it's I've, just beating. I've like... never been like if someone <laughs> slaps me in the face. Yeah. I'm just gonna be like, ow, don't, don't do that again. That hurt. What, how did you, I, I, don't, I still don't understand. If someone punches you in the face repeatedly, aren't you gonna have damage? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I was pretty banged up. I couldn't walk for about a week and he had also stretched out my knee tendons with heel hooks and so I was pretty banged up. Could there be permanent damage? I mean, obviously there could be. Well, I mean, I probably got some brain damage, but you know, <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, uh, you know, tendons torn and I broke a rib and he broke my nose and stuff like that, but all that stuff heals, you know? So it wasn't anything like really serious, but it was the first like wake up call. You know, when you're, you know, I considered myself a very tough man. You know, like I walked the streets, like, I, you know, I considered myself a very, tough person until that day mm. and then i just woke up like it was literally like like how could another human being do this to me and, and so did you see that the suddenly the difference between kind of like street style fighting and oh there's something almost he's using some techniques yeah or, yeah i or, could tell like right away like mm -hmm. there was it was just it was so different from any other physical confrontation because it wasn't like he was just stronger than you yeah. so yeah, hitting you harder destroy like it was everything was he was just destroying me like it was just like crush smash you know and i and and to my you know detriment like i didn't even know what the rules were you know no one told me i could tap you know i was in prison i didn't know this whole thing was evolving becoming a sport like i didn't see or hear any of it so i didn't know what to do and i just fought like i was fighting for my life so to me it was a very different experience than i'm sure they were having Mm. Yeah, because I'm like straight out of prison. Like two days after I got out of prison, I was in the gym, mm. you know, and I never left. And that's, you know, that's how I became successful. What does it mean to be beaten up? Like beaten. By, a, by a professional fighter? Just, just beaten. Like, you know. You, you go to a hospital, like, can you're you die? So, no, no, not like that. Why don't people you're die? Just, like you're just tired. You're like, you, you're so exhausted. Because if you don't know how to fight, you don't know how to use your energy or your body and the energies correctly. So besides the fear and all the angst, there's also this, you know, tremendous drain. Like you just lose all of your energy very, very quickly because you don't know what to do with it all. Yeah, but he's also at the same time, it's not like you're running a race and getting tired. At the same time that's happening, someone's punching you in the face, punching oh, yeah. you in the stomach, <laughs> yeah. kicking you in the groin, tripping you. I thought I was going to die. Like I honestly, because I, I had never been beaten up. I mean, I fight on the street. Like, if you get beat up, you know, that means you're, like, getting killed in an alley. So, like, I've never, I was never knocked down. Like, I've never been beaten up. Until Even in jail, day. you weren't beaten no, up? No, no, never. No, I've never been, you know, I always, if you, I, I never mess with people. But if you mess with me, mm. you know, you get the one warning. And then, <laughs> you know, then you get the rest of it. Uh. So, but most people can tell by my intention, I'm not playing. <laughs> so, no one ever messes with me. Right. But. What do you mean by your intention? Like. How do you, um, how do you, give me the look that's like, don't mess well, with you. Most people don't really want to fight uh -huh. because it's incredibly dangerous and scary. Yeah. And we survived by getting away. So the, the truth in the human spirit is they don't really want to fight. There's some other thing going on, ego, or there's some other issue. So what I've learned is I know how to fight and I know how to talk to people that know how to see that I know how to fight. So I just tell people the truth. Like, if you keep doing this, 
you're going to force me to do X, Y, and Z. What's and, X, Y, and Z? Um, you, I usually add something vulgar, like, you know, you're going to force me to put you to sleep and stuff you under a chair. Like, mm -hmm. I say something like weird that's arresting. Because <laughs> they'd be like, what? Like, what? what? Did he just say that? Mm -hmm. And so I use like a weird psychological thing. But um, I'm honest with people. Hey, I'm not interested in that. And, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Can I buy you a drink? And I just try to flip it. And then if they don't, and I get real, which is if you keep messing with me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you in front of all your friends. Like I just go real. And they're always like, he's either crazy or he's being real. I feel like, I feel like that works for you because <laughs> I can even see you're sort of huge. But yeah. If someone <laughs> came up to me and was in my face, what should I do? If I just if I don't want to fight, like I never want to yeah. fight, what should I say to get them to back off? I wasn't planning on asking you this, because yeah. but I'm just curious. Like you, you, you looking at me, like what should I do? You sh uh, and should I run? Human <laughs> beings should be able to de-escalate any situation. Huh. That's interesting. Human beings. So animals, you know, we, we can't negotiate with animals, but human beings should be able to have a conversation and you should be able to de-escalate. But sometimes people are crazy, right? Yeah. So like, go, you you know, someone comes into a bar, p p picks on you and you say, hey, can I buy you a drink? And they just slap your drink off the bar. Like, no. Like, and because I'm, you know, I'm clearly easy, easy to fight. So what would I, what would you suggest I do? Walk away. Yeah, walk away. Um, so away. I'm not going to say, hey, buddy. Why? I'm You're not going to fight. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to fight. Think about the end game. Right. Are you going to fight? No. If you fuck with me, I'm going to fight. Right. And I'm going to crush you. And I'm going to lead with that so I don't get messed with. I think that's the difference in so there's no bluffing. There's no bluffing. I don't bluff. Because no humans probably are pretty good at determining ultimately a bluff at that level. Yeah. And then it, it's no one ever comes up with, I want to fight you. Mm. Like no one ever is doing that. It's all the, you know, I'm drunk. I was in this weird, you know, la, 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 la. There's all these other circumstances that make people think they want to fight you. But when you get real with people, they just, you know, they just lose it. And then I, I do a lot of, and this is what I'd recommend you do, is I do a lot of psychology when I talk to people. You know, I'm not, you know, confrontational. I'm not, you know, if a guy bumps into me, I'm saying I'm sorry. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Because I don't know if he bumped into me or I bumped into him. But, you know, I wouldn't want to be me. <laughs> right. Right? So I'm the first guy like, oh, my God, I, did I step on your shoe? I'm sorry, dude. Um, whereas most people would just, well, whatever. So I'm, I'm just very connected to it. And then, you know, if I see a guy who's really drunk, you know, I'll just get all medieval and, you know, lower my voice and lean in and, you know, be like, listen, buddy, you seem like a nice guy. <laughs> and just get all. Because you're about to die. Yeah. And like, but, you know, like, I'm here with my family and, you know, you're, you know, you're now making me very unpleasant, you know. I'm a professional fighter. And if you keep doing this, here's what I'm going to do. Hmm. And you say it nice and quiet where they're not embarrassed. And I, I lean right into their ear. But I'm also willing to fight. Like, if you mess with me, I will fight you. Right. So, you know, but, but most people don't want to fight. No, that's interesting because you even... Almost all of them. And, and, and we're, we're skipping around a little bit, but like, I mean, I saw in, in the documentary on Spike, what, what was the name of it? You, Bound by Blood. Bound by Blood. So what, what, once you started kind of saying, hey, I want to um, I wanna learn this, I want to do this, I want to compete in this, what was, your, what, what was your initial regimen? Like, how did you start getting better? Um, well, I, I, I took the same kind of scholastic schooling approach because when I got to prison, I kind of woke up and I was like, wow, I just screwed up my whole life. I got three and a half years to do. I have no education. I have 20 felonies. Like, I'm totally a screw-up. And I, would, I realized then, you know, all that stuff the counselors were telling me was true. I was going to screw my life up. Crime was not a good tool. Like, it was all just kind of fell on me. And what I did was, you know, I, I saw all my friends from childhood there with me. And I was like, this is not the way to go. So I went the other way. I went to college. I got educated. And I completely changed who I was as a human being. I changed my intentions, my beliefs. Like, I, you know... I changed who I was. And my new intention was I was going to provide for my son. My son was, you know, a baby then. And I was going to, um, you know, not become, not be a criminal anymore. I was going to educate myself and, you know, change my life for the better. And in that journey, Bob came along, you know, and was like stripping or fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and so clearly, clearly he was probably even joking with you. He, probably, he clearly wanted you to fight and, and help no, I think he was, Ken. I think he was dead on the 50-50. I think he was huh. into it because Ken had a very successful career as a stripper. And so he, Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, when he, so Ken was a professional wrestler. 
And then he, you know, when he needed money, he would do stripping and then he would do professional wrestling. And before the fighting got big, you know, that's how he kind of made his money. He was, you know, made money off his body. So it was perfectly natural for my dad to say, hey, you got this great asset. You know, here's the two avenues that Ken's made money. Pick one. And, and to be clear, he, this is not the dad that had uh, been abusing you when you were 11. He yeah. adopted you as as he got to know you when you were older and so on. Yeah. So he adopted you and he adopted Ken, right? Yeah, Ken first and then yeah, he adopted me years later. And so just out of curiosity, what do you think comes first? Actions or intentions? So did you start? So you got, you, you, you realize, okay, I'm in jail, I'm screw up and so on. But did... Did you start finding things that you were interested in studying and then kind of your intentions changed? Or did you say, I better, I don't know, go to college so I get out of this life? Or well, I, I, maybe there's a subtle, only a subtle difference, but I'm just curious what you, what you think about it. For me, I, it was real simple. I had a manila folder. Mm -hmm. I sat down with myself and God one day and I wrote down all the things I was on the front of that folder. I was a liar, I was a cheat, I was a thief, I was a criminal, like all the stuff that, that I was. And then on the back of that folder, I wrote down all the stuff I was going to become. World champion, spokesman, you know, all the stuff that I, I dreamt of becoming. And then all the things, all the actions, all the needs were, and the things I was studying were the pieces of paper in the middle of that file. I see. So you kind of said to, um, for each action, would this action take me closer to this side or would this action take me closer to this side? And you chose presumably the actions that would take you closer to the positive side. Yep. And every day when I opened it, I got to see exactly what I was now hmm. and what got me there, which was me being who I was. Oh. Inside was all the meat. And then every time I finished, I just closed it and went, and that's where we go. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, Big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 
NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. After Ken kind of beat you up that first time, did you say, okay, how, how did you start training and how did you start getting into, you know, mastering the field? You, you've, you've mastered that whole art form. I mean, now things are a little different. It's like you say, um, you know, techniques, training, everything sort of evolves. Uh, but, but back then you were uh, not even, not, not so long ago, but you were, you were the peak, you were the, you were the giant. So what was your regimen to, to get there, to get beyond where anybody else had gone? Uh, the first thing was I got a notebook because I was the only guy taking notes and drawing mm -hmm. diagrams and pictures because when I read the J. Cohn notebook, it was all notes and, you know, it was Bruce's drawings from his, from his journey. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think I got that very much from going to college and stuff in prison. I had a very scholastic, you know, experience. So I was the only guy with a notebook mm -hmm. for years. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I figured it out is because I, you know, wrote it down, asked a question, create a theory, practice, apply, it works, you know, put it in stone. Um, but it was really the focus. I mean, I, I put a hundred percent of my brain to it to where every single night when I fell asleep, I just continued training, dreaming and going through the same theories and strategies and techniques as when I was awake. Mm. So my brain just never turned off. And that's how I was able to evolve so quickly in the sport is once my body got strong, it's pretty strong anyways, but once my body got accustomed to the techniques and the energy needs, um, I just, it all clicked. So, 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 uh, talk to me more about the, the energy needs. So with each, so obviously again, you, it's back to the, you know, you want to use as little energy as possible to cause as much damage as possible. What were some of the things you learned really quickly that you didn't know before that would preserve energy? Uh, um, balance, leverage, uh, our, our theory, our system is based on leverage. So it's like, uh, a plate on top of a ball. You always want to be the plate because then your weight is the biggest weapon. Mm. So just learning that, you know, and how to use your weight as a weapon. I didn't realize, but Ken was just putting all his weight on me half the time. And I was going, ah, because I didn't know what to do with all of this weight. And for me, the effort that it took to move the weight was what was making me tired. Is that why in boxing, some, uh, I mean, I, I kind of know the answer to this, but is that why in boxing, sometimes you see one, particularly in heavyweight fights, you see one of the fighters just like grab a guy and they're like, just, it seems like they're just sort of resting, but probably what's happening is the, the, the one guy's putting all his weight on the other guy. And so the other guy has to expend a lot of energy, even though it seems like nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. Hey, mm -hmm. lean on them, you weigh on them. And there's a million tricks to using your energy effectively. And then um, the other thing is because I was studying so much, you know, all the techniques, like I was telling you, they've evolved and they've changed. So, you know, I was learning techniques, but also learning better ways to do them because I was studying the whole time. So I was like, what about this and that? And move your leg there and try this. So one of the reasons why I continued to evolve, in fact, I, I became a teacher after six months, six months of training. I was teaching other fighters mm. because I'd taught people in prison and, you know, I ran a boot camp. Like I, you know, all the areas of development that I needed or thought I would need for this career, I picked up, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, I think the big difference is I didn't care about being tough. I didn't care about being, you know, the toughest guy in the room. Like I literally just wanted to figure this thing out and become the best at it. It sounds like what you were doing was, um, you, there, there was this, let's say, let's call it a meta skill fighting. And then you broke it up into, um, a lot of micro skills, like, like, uh, balance or footwork or punching or kickboxing. So all of these are completely different skills but each one kind of had to be learned to be an ultimate 
mm-hmm. fighter. And it sounds like that's what you were doing. Because it, it seems like beforehand, people would be either be a wrestler or they would do karate or they would do boxing. And, and none of those disciplines by themselves is going to let someone be, you know, a mixed martial arts champion. I feel like you ha- kind of have to learn all of them. And so, and, and it was this combination that really makes the, the art form. It really made this, it really created the sport. So w- what made you realize you had to learn many, many different martial arts? Because certain people with certain skills would affect me. And so, you know, a strong wrestler would be able to control me. So then I'd have to, you know, learn to use my legs and my hips more. So I was very much, because I didn't know anything. I was just, if it worked, we used it. If it didn't, I just stopped using it. But it's the classic thing where you're, it, you're, you're doing study. It's almost like you're doing a scientific study on, your, on, yourself. on yourself. And what just worked against you, and like a wrestler, you just said, would do something to restrain you or hold you down. And you'd have to figure out, you'd have to really stay to figure out, well, how can I fight that? And then the next wrestler comes along, how can I fight that? I mean, it, it's the classic of not learning from failure, but learning by... Because uh, I, I don't like that phrase so much, but learning from experimentation almost. Yeah. And this is this is one of those sports where you're using your body like intimately. So you have to experiment and you have to understand everything about it. And we always say the best fighter would be um, a ballroom dancer who was a gymnast. Because hmm. you'd never catch it when they could move their body in any position you wanted to. Like, you know, they, they would be so powerful with their being, with their body. Um, and the other thing which most people don't realize, and I, I say it in passing because it, it, it makes people think, but I look at people's bodies and I do a complete diagnosis of your structure, your biomechanics, and what I think it would take to beat you. That all happens in like 15 just, seconds. So you just point right at my forehead <laughs> and push me over and <laughs> so, I'm When dead. I see people, because I've trained, I trained for you know, 16 years, every night focus. So when I see a human body, I don't see tall, skinny. I just see structures that have power. Okay, but the average person on the street is basically all the same in the sense that they they sit in a chair, a chair all day going to work. They probably have don't really eat as healthy as possible. They don't really exercise as much as they should. So the average person must look all the same to you, which is just I have to punch this guy in the gut and then <laughs> knee him in the head when he bends over <laughs> yeah. and he's gone. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if you go deeper into it, what it really comes down to is I was studying the biomechanics of the human body. They were studying fighting. Hmm. I was studying the human body and how it inter- and how to maximize it. And they were studying technical fighting. So that reminds me. I'm uh, I'm going to make a leap that might sound funny, but it reminds me of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So every ar- artist was studying how to paint, but he was doing autopsies on bodies to understand really how, you know, how to depict a human body. He was just studying, you know, how the sun would would hit, you know, would shade the different parts of the body so you could really understand how to draw the body in a complex way as opposed to just understanding how to how to paint, which is what most people were doing back then. And so it seems here is that you evolved the art form by going that one level deeper of not just how do I crush this person, but how how is the body working so that I can cause the most damage. It's almost like these imaginary points, or I don't know if they're imaginary or not, but like, oh, if I touch this person here, they're, they're dead. So is but that- that's how I look at the human body. Hmm. So it just, it's an assessment. It's like, uh, and I think it's just from all the training because I, you know, body mechanics work. So I look at a human body and it's like, okay, arms are long, you know, structure, strength. And I make it just in my mind, there's a mental assessment, which has a numerical value. And so if you see a guy on the street, can you tell if they're a fighter? Oh yeah, yeah. I can tell anybody who who has the intention of fighting, mm. and I think that's the big um, separating factor between people that want to fight and people that don't want to fight. Ninety nine percent of people do not want to fight, but there's a few people that want to fight, and you can tell by their intention. When well, I when I lower my voice and I speak, I speak with the intention that I'm going to break your face in two <laughs> seconds if you don't stop doing that. That's why people go. Let me know oh. if I upset you during this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why people go. Oh, he must be serious because who else is? you know, speaking all crazy like that. So, so I remember there was one guy you were fighting, uh, Asian guy, and uh, the, it was mentioned he trained with, uh, he, was, he was willing to die, or he had the will to die is how he trained. So kind of, kind of being, I guess you, you can set yourself up psychologically so that you throw yourself so fiercely into a fight 
without being worried about death. Almost this stoic way of looking at fighting. And this was one of the our initial people you you fought when your career was was moving up. Um, do you think that's a helpful helpful way to look at fighting? To think that you could die and oh, be, yeah. and be okay with that? For sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think it's a, a good way to approach life. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, one of the best sayings in Native American culture is "Today's a good day to die," mm-hmm. which means you're in the right place and everything's taken care of. So you go do it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean we always make a joke about it. People always ask me, you know, how did you stay focused? And you know, what do you do to train your mind? This and stuff. And I would tell this joke, but it's the truth. Um, and I'd say it in a funny way. I'd say, I, I say this gentle, gentle mantra to myself, which helps focus my mind. And they would lean in. They'd be like, tell me it. I go, it goes just like this. Die, die, die. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm trying to kill every person that I'm in front of and I'm willing to die to do it. And so, so, so you, you, you make, you say that that's could be analogous to life, but let's say, and so there, there's the cliche of, um, um, you know, live life as if today's your last day, but of course there's more nuance to it because if you have kids and you want them to grow up and, and, and I don't know, either go to college or buy a home or whatever, uh, you kind of have to save up for them. So you can't always live life like, okay, I'm going to spend all my money today. I'm going to, you know, go crazy today because today's the day I'm going to die. Where's the balance there? How do you find that balance? Well, I think you got to roll it back because um, it's an expression of all things are right. It, the, wor- it, the work is done. Like, it's done. So, you know, it, when you're a warrior and everything's cared for, you can go out and, and go to the death because everything's cared for. I see. So, so when it's and, not cared for, you probably shouldn't go out there and, <laughs> and fight to the death. Right. So that that's again leads to um, that Manila folder. Do you go to this side or to that side? So if if you're if not everything's cared for, okay, let's just go. Let's just today go in a direction where the things that are not cared for are cared for. So you could every day make again make. The, so so you mentioned the Warriors Code uh, just now, and you mentioned it in the in the documentary. What what? What does that mean to you? What what are those? What's that code? Well, those are basically the principles of martial arts for me. Mm-hmm. So those are honor, respect, discipline, which applies to everything. Honor, respect, discipline, discipline. Yeah. Honor to what? What does honor mean? Honor is um, well. The first thing that comes to mind is honesty. I used mm-hmm. to have a problem with honesty, so now I'm thousand percent honest. So mm-hmm. my word is my honor. So if I give you my word, that's all you need. You know, if I tell you something, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's just because that's honor. You know, if I promise you something, I'm going to do it. That's honor. If we do deal together, I won't screw you because I'm an honorable person. Mm. So I, I run everything like that in my life. Mm. And, you know, the factor of discipline is, listen, if you're not disciplined, you'll never be successful. You'll never guide people, lead people. Like, you know, you'll never achieve the next level physically, mentally, spiritually. You just won't because how, you have how, no discipline. How do you determine what you should be disciplined in? Mm. Mind, body, and spirit. Plus, minus, equal. So what do we need? What are we looking for? What do we want? I think a lot of times people sit, might be listening to the saying, I'm 35, I'm 40, I'm 45, I'm 50. I either don't know what I want because I've spent so much time, you know, just kind of getting through each day or 50 plus and I feel like it's too late for me to do what I want. Well, what would you say to those, those people? If you're breathing, you can do anything you want. Hmm. Well, the problem is we get caught in all these lies and we get caught in all these roles that we're living. And most of them are just social obligations or stuff we think that we're supposed to be doing. The reality is you can do anything you want, good, bad. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you'll have to pay the consequences or reap the rewards. The truth is you're in control of every action. You can do anything you want. I could wake up tomorrow and start living a convict again. Like I can still, I can start stealing stuff tomorrow. Um, but that would go against my morals and everything that I've built up and everything I believe in. This, I see life is like a big journey. And I believe you're supposed to become the best human being throughout this journey. And you're supposed to help everybody else do the same. Mm. And if you don't, you're not that good of a person. You're an okay person. You're an all right person. But those people that go, no, 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 I'm going to make myself the best human being possible. And I'm going to take everybody around me and do the same thing. That's how you move the world and change, mess- change things. And, and that's how I live my life. And only because I went through such an experience, I know what the bottom's like. Like I know... You know, I mean, we, we were laughing today. It was like, I, I stood in line for government cheese when I was a kid. 
That's disgusting. And I remember standing in line <laughs> and bottom. going, well, all right, we're getting the cheese. And so I told the story to my daughter and she's like, she goes, what cheese? She goes, where does the cheese come from? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I know what it's like to have zero. And you can always build up. You can always build up. But it starts, it starts by changing this. You can change your mind. Change your mind to believe that it's possible? Yeah. And then what's the very next thing after that? Action. You got to take action. And here's why people get to 50 and don't and aren't living the lives that they want to. They're not doing personal reflection. They're not writing their dreams down. They don't have a plan to accomplish it. So they're just doing what they do. But everything, I sold a movie. I just wrote it down. I'm, I'm going to sell a movie. I, I wrote two books. I just wrote it down one day. I'm going to write a book. That was it. And once I made the intention and talked to an author and da 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 a year later, we have a book. Most people never write it down. They never take the intention because they're afraid they won't do it. I think that's right. And, and I think people also, they look too far to the end product. Like if you said to yourself, a year from now, I'm going to have a book, that might be too scary, a thought. But if you say to yourself, okay, a book, I, I, I value the idea of having a book in a year. That seems like a good intention to have. The first step is finding an author. Um, I think breaking things down into smaller steps. Like I'm sure when you studied what back in the day, kickboxing for the first time, you didn't say to yourself, okay, I'm going to kick a guy off a horse. You probably figured, well, what's the first things I need to do to strengthen my legs or whatever it is. I'm just making this up, but there's probably like micro steps with each thing that you have to learn. Yeah. And that is the beauty of the basis of martial arts, small incremental improvements to achieve a larger goal. Hmm. And then that tying into what your body needs protection, whatever, and what your community needs. And it's like, that's the martial arts journey. When you get that down, then you're, then you're cracking. I you're so that. in touch with your being and the beings around you, and you're all on this positive growth mission. So it's like you can't help but come out of it a better human being. So I never thought of it that way. So the basis of martial arts is small incremental changes to, what was the, what was the final part that you just said? To, to perfection, to excellence, to... Mm -hmm. To, uh, and you're never going to achieve that. No. So it's always small incremental changes every day. And it's, but imagine if you went to a place every day and the whole conversation was, that's great. Let's make it better. Like just the tiniest bit better today. And then we'll do the same tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. After a hundred days, you've got a hundred like mini improvements. And that's how you build people up. Mm -hmm. You know, I did that myself because I didn't know. I just went, mm, here's my intention. Here's what I have to do. The community came and supported me. The resources came out. But it's like, until you make that intention, until you show up at the martial arts school, until you show up at class, you know, it doesn't, nothing changes. And again, also, it's interesting that you're allowed to define it for yourself. Like there's no one school of thought from 3000 years ago. That's the school you, you, I mean, again, you combined all these schools, uh, to create your own style of fighting. Um, so w when you, when you were actually kind of moving up through the ranks and destroying everyone in your path, literally, what was like the hardest fight you were in where you had to really use your brain to say, okay, he's presenting a problem and I have to figure out in real time how to solve this problem. Uh, it was fighting uh, Ensign Inoue in Japan, that big Asian dude. Uh, the one who had Hawaiian the will to guy. die. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, and he's, you know, half Japanese, half Hawaiian. So they're very much the Bushido, you know, the Bushido way. Um, and it was you know, about seven minutes into the fight, he, he folded me over backwards and mounts me. He's like on top of me, elbowing my face in. And, um, why don't you just collapse then? <laughs> just give up. Well, hey, so it he's just, huge. It's he's not huge. like just like a small no, guy he, doing this. Yeah. He's like, you know, 20 plus pounds on me and he's, you know, got me in the most, you know, vulnerable position. Um, and he's just elbowing away on my face. What does he mean? He folds you over backwards. We're standing clenched up. I was trying to knee him. So my hips were getting too close and he mm. went from a, a high grab to a waist grab. And then he pulled mm. my waist into his and stepped forward. He, yeah. he took your energy of moving closer to him. And he switched on you to kind yeah. of push that in. And so he folds me over backwards like this. Like I wrench my back and then he jumps on top of my chest and he's like elbowing my face in. So it was one of those moments where um, I thought I was going to die. Like I was like, there's no way I'm going to survive this. But I wasn't going to give up. So I was like, okay, well, there's a problem here. <laughs> <laughs> problem. And that was the problem. Uh. So, um, but what I did was, you know, I just stayed true to my intention. My intention was nobody's going to kill me. So 
you know, I just had a moment where I was like, he's going to kill me. And then I went, wait a minute, nobody can kill me. And I got up and knocked him out. And so how did you though get out of that particular situation? He's in control of you at that point. Yeah, I, um, I just hung on and kept moving. And I could tell uh, he was getting tired of beating on me actually. Uh, and then the other thing that I was doing was I had learned to use my skeletal muscles to hang off people. And we talked about leaning on them mm. and applying weight to them. Mm. So even though he was on top of me, I was actually hanging off of his body. So he was holding up. But him slamming on your, on your yeah, face so he's, so I, wasn't like, enough to I'm get I'm your... like this, and, and he's literally lifting me up to hit me. But he's lifting my body weight. So after mm. about 10 times, he's tired. Mm. And so I had to kind of brave this moment where he's like, you know. How did I, you hold on for the 10 times? <laughs> I just, um, I, I made that commitment. I knew, you know. that. Uh, here's the thing is, you know, I, I was like, they're going to have to kill me to take me out of here. You know, I'm never going to give up. Like, this is my thing. This is my chance. You know, I'm going to go all in. Um, but you never know until you're at that moment. Like, you never know until death is right there and you're looking at it. And, you know, I thought that was my moment. So I just had this, you know, I had this moment in my spirit, which was, am I really ready? And then I went, not only am I ready, this guy ain't going to kill me. <laughs> and I got, I got, you know, I, I wiggled out and, you know, went into a firefight and ended up knocking him out. And and that kind of um sort of so-called rope-a-dope style, this one where where they're like just wailing on you and you do things to get them tired until finally you can switch. You did that again with uh, Tito Ruiz. Yeah, Ortiz. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ortiz. And because he was like a, like, he was just out there hungry for, to kill you. <laughs> and uh, and he's, he was very polite about it later. You know, he's on the documentary talking about it. But you were holding on against, you know, uh, into the edge. Like, what, what was happening there? He was just, you know, the next size of athlete. You mm -hmm. know, he's really a, he's really a heavyweight. Mm -hmm. But he's able to, to drop down into the middleweight, um, the middleweight category. Uh, and he was just so big. He was so strong. You know, he was so, he was the next size up. It just took so much energy to, to, to battle with. Him. Were you afraid getting in the ring or no? No, I knew I could beat Tito. Mm -hmm. Like I... This is how confident I was to beat Tito. I signed a four-fight extension to my contract and put in the clause, if I ever publicly retire, the rest of the contract is null and void because I knew I'd beat Tito, stand up on pay-per-view, retire, and become the first free agent. So you knew you would beat Tito, even though in the middle of that fight, you probably also knew that you would have 30 or so punches on your face <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> yeah. So but he was just so, it was so big. Like, if you, if you see us together... It's silly. Yeah. And when we did the, the poster for the fight, they literally slid out an apple box. They're like, I'm so sorry, Mr. Shamrock. And the guy slides out. Can you stand on this? It just doesn't look right. Because I'm like this. You know, uh, I'm staring up at this giant man. Um, but he was just the next size up. And the, the next level in, you know, physical needs. And I was, I was the first super athlete guy, but that's what really, you know, I needed that super athleticism and the technique to beat him. So you were talking earlier about the, the warrior code. We did honor, discipline, respect. What what comes what comes next, if anything? Um, well, let's see. So the mind, body, and spirit are the way. Mm -hmm. um, the how is the um, honor, respect, and discipline. And then um, there's a few minor mechanics of it. The idea of consistent improvement is either wrapped up in the journey to excellence, or uh, we also call it Kaizen, small incremental improvements or um, practice. Um, and it's really those like three concepts. What about people who who know what the right, like let's take an obvious example. Someone who smokes knows that it's probably wrong to smoke, but they don't stop. Um, and they would like to stop even. Let, 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 let's assume every possible thing. Their intentions are good. They want to stop. They're addicted to it, but you know, there's ways to overcome addiction, but they just don't stop. Or I'll use an example personal to me. I know I should go to the gym every day or, or I should exercise probably more than I do. I have just recently started going to the gym, but for the first time in like six years. So I should probably be exercising more than I do, but it's hard for me because I don't enjoy it. And now you shouldn't enjoy anything that's worth having is probably not enjoyable. Like when your when your brother first beat you up, <laughs> I'm sure you weren't having a fun time, and yet that propelled you to worldwide success. So 
It seems like writing a book is not enjoyable. And yet when it's done, that's what you, you did a good job. And, uh, but sometimes you can't do everything that's not enjoyable in order to achieve many different kinds of success. So I don't know, how should I think differently about lifting weights? Make it fun. How do I do that? Do something you like to do. I guarantee you there's a physical activity that you enjoy doing that's fun and that will give you a good workout. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. got a dog. I walk my dog twice a day. Right, so I get you walking? <laughs> so I'm walking twice a day. I'm like about. hiking and I'm walking twice a day. And even what? though I work out, it's still another chance for me to do a little more. Um, but we, here's the thing is we all know what's good for us. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean we're doing it. I, well, I knew, you know, when I'm about 13 or 14, like I was a total knucklehead and that I was screwing everything up. Didn't mean I stopped. Do you know what I mean? Like you really need those big wake up calls. You well, know, what's, my, some, what's something for you right now that you, I mean, cause, because also we can't do everything that we would like to do in our lives. What's something for you that's right in that gray area where you, you would like to do more of, but you haven't yet uh, had enough intention or, or motivation to actually start doing it? Mine is even stranger. Because when I was 16, I was diagnosed with a spondylolisthesis. My right leg had gone numb and started to drag behind me. Mm. So what that means is that. one of my little vertebrae is broken off in my lower spine. And I have no stability in the left side of my lower spine. So throughout my whole career, I've had this problem. Um, so yeah, I, somebody just starts punching you in the left yeah, side of your spine. Yeah, hit me on the left side. And I'm like, oh, no. All right, now we um, know. But recently, I met this doctor who's like, gave me a whole new understanding of my spine. He said, basically, he's like, listen, you're just a wussy. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you're thinking you have a hurt spine when you just have these muscle imbalances. He's like, let me rebalance you. Let me show you the exercise to do. And I guarantee you'll never have pain again. I'm like, this is amazing. So he unlocks my back, does the thing. Everything's amazing. Shows me the exercise. He's like, you can't do this exercise enough. Do it every day, all day long. I do it every third day. <laughs> so you just don't, you just, it's not fun for you. It's not fun. And it feels weird. It's uncomfortable, but it makes me better. Like night it, and day better. Is there some benefit from doing it every third day or are you no. kind of you're just I, the, losing the all the benefits? The benefit would be to have it every day, several right. times a day. Um, and it takes me three minutes to do it. Like most of us, it's a very short period of time. But I, I'm like, oh, and I need a table to lay on. Like I make a million excuses not to do it. I and you know, know I need to do it. It's kind of important because... You know, you're not getting any younger, Frank. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> and, so true. Uh, you know, at some point, this becomes degenerative, right? So you have to start doing it. <laughs> but we all know, like, we know why we're overweight. Mm -hmm. We know why we're stressed. We know all these things. But what are we doing about it? And it's like, you know, I was very blessed in that I found martial arts. And it became my way to connect with the community, learn about myself, explore things. Mm -hmm. You know, it became my world. And, you know, very few people have that where you can walk into a door and you're just suddenly part of this amazing, you know, personal development community. So to me, like, it was just such a powerful experience. I didn't even know it existed. Like, I didn't know you could go to martial arts schools and all that stuff, you know, even happened there. Right, because again, it's not like martial arts, as you've described in this podcast, it's not just about, oh, being able to kick a guy in the face. It's all this kind of method of excellence that could be applied to any area of life. Anything. And you see that really in a lot of Asian cultures that, you know, like imagine the Japanese tea ceremony is almost like a martial art, just the way every aspect is ritualized and, 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 and it's sort of this movement towards perfection of the, of the tea ceremony. So it seems to apply the same principles. Mm -hmm. um, so, so your career lasted a really long time. I mean, you, you went, you know, I don't know the exact number of years, but you were really kind of at the top of your game for, for a long time, for at least... I mean, it's hard to constantly fight for 10 years. It is. Or, or, or longer. I don't even know. I did know. 16 years straight, and I went undefeated for 10 years. Undefeated for 10 years? Yeah. What happened the first time you, you, got, you, you lost? Ah, I got disqualified. Okay. Because I need uh, Henzo Gracie from New York. I need, oh, I need yeah. him in the back of the head, um, which I thought was perfectly legal. Uh, but it, it turns out it wasn't. So what, what about the first time you, you lost, lost? Was it Diaz? First time I lost, lost uh, was Kung Lee. He broke my arm. So, oh, yeah, right, yeah I remember that. that. I, couldn't, I couldn't continue after that. That was the first time I really got hurt, too. Like, you know, wake up call. And, and that was when I started planning my exit. You know? and, then, and, then, um, and then it kind of after your, your, one of your last fights, or maybe your last fight was uh, 
uh, I forgot his first name, Diaz. Yeah, Nick. Um, Nick Diaz. And it, there's this real sense that, okay, you're handing over to the next generation. What do you think he was doing differently? Or let, let's even take it a little further. Um, this recent fight that happened in the past few weeks, and, and I don't follow the sport at all, but like uh, George St. Pierre, yeah. the GSP, um, what's he doing differently where he's just so clearly vanquishing his opponents? He's just a martial artist mm -hmm. and he hasn't stopped studying. Mm -hmm. I think that's where, you know, his value is, you know, in this one, you only are as good in this sport. You're only as good as your study. Mm -hmm. So if you leave studying, everyone just keeps learning, getting better. You wouldn't think that though. You would think you're yeah. only as good as your ability to kill somebody. Yeah. This one's literally because, you know, you, you, you have to stay on top of this thing. And then the, you know, the styles and the moves and stuff ebb and flow with popularity. Who's winning? Who's doing this? So you really have to kind of stay on top of the, the art. And he stayed on top of it. And when you watch, when you watch him now, do you, are you like, oh, I see what he's doing there. That's really interesting. He, he's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. But the sport has de-evolved technically. So that's the, the weird thing about the sport now is because television and because, you know, these mediums have gotten so big, the level of athlete has diminished a little bit. Really? Because now you need character, personality, presentation. Mm. There's a lot more to the, to the presentation. So we're drawing from a different crowd. It's athletes and other people that want to be on TV and that want to be, you know, in that type of sporting experience. I see. So, so often charisma or some type of weird charisma is driving people to the top, but you have a guy like GSP who can, kept studying so he's able to destroy that guy. So he's a martial artist and he's a super athlete. And, you know, he's still, he's still focused on martial arts. If, mm. if I tried to do it, I'd be like, I'd get my ass kicked. It's I'm not, yeah, I don't dream about it. You know, it's all out of my head now. Where, where do you see yourself going in the next uh, 20 years? For in martial arts? No, just in general. In general? Um, I'm just gonna, I mean, you've, you've yeah. hit the top of the world, the world in, in one area of life. So yeah. you could. I'm going to keep. Working on my community because I, I live in a wonderful community. Um, looking for ways to impact it. You know, our family is so blessed. Like we're, we're, we're healthy and we're doing really well. Um, and really my next thing and what I'm focused on next year is this mental health awareness campaign and this mission. Um, I've been greatly affected by mental health and a lot of my clients and my community have been affected by mental health. And T tell me how. Uh, you know, one of my best friends is bipolar. You know, and I've, I've been caring for him for about seven or eight years. Um, and in the journey, I've learned so much about it. You know, I've learned so much about how public feels about it and, you know, how he survives. And I mean, I've literally read, you know, 50 books on the subject. And, not, you know, like, I feel like I'm really educated on it in my desire to help and care for him. You know, it's, I didn't know that uh, about you and your friend. I knew you were focused on, on mental health, but one of the closest people in my life is affected by bipolar and I didn't realize until I saw it in person, face to face, how how different bipolar is from how the movies say portray it. They they sort of portray it like, okay, sometimes you're sad and sometimes you're really happy and maybe even really energetic. It's not that way at all. When someone's in mania, it's like the person you knew has checked out and something new and sort of very horrible has checked in. Yep. And that's why a lot of these people end up homeless because they, they create a scorched earth of community around them. And also a lot of them end up dead. They end up committing suicide. Like bipolar is, a, is, a, is almost a terminal disease. So why don't you think most people realize the, the, the severity of mental illnesses like bipolar, borderline personality disorder? Like these are real, you know, neurological disorders. Yeah, I mean, we've, We've just in the past decade started paying attention to it, you know, and before that, you know, I mean, look at, look at the culture of, of having mental issues. You know, it's just been, you know, portrayed to be, you know, crazy people, violent people, you know, the portrayal, um, the general message of it. It's just not, you know, it's not good. No, so and people it, don't know what to do. People literally don't, when I talk to, cause I talk like this and they're like, I don't even know what to say to you. Like, how are we talking about this? <laughs> like, we have to talk about it. You know, this is a real thing. Um, you know, what we see that, you know, the human development of your brain, your brain can handle just about anything, but you, you need to learn in doses and you need to, 
you know, your brain's made of plastic. It'll consume, change, do anything you want it to, good or bad. Um, but, you know, people don't understand their brain. They don't know, you know, when everything you put in it is a computer. You're just recording. Everything you do, it becomes who you are. And it becomes how you are. Uh, people don't think about that. You know, people don't think of your mind as a, you know, as a space you need to develop and but but even but with mental on. illness though sometimes it goes one step further which is that that computer has faulty programming yeah and the person who's the the let's let's call it the, the the person who has the illness he or she can't necessarily control how that input is coming in anymore or, or what the output is or they're having problems with that and and i think i think awareness of that's very important for instance you know, there's been a lot of news uh, in the past year about uh, police brutality and police, you know, killing people. Um, you know, it's the whole, um, you know, very important issue, Black Lives Matter. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that 61% of those lives are mentally ill people and, and that were, you know, killed because the police didn't realize they were mentally ill. Uh, it's a serious issue. So, so how can we all work to raise awareness of this? Well, I think it starts by um, repositioning the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're all talking about an illness that nobody can see. You know, it's, it's, a lot of people don't believe it. Yeah, some people don't believe it. Some people are against it. Some people culturally can't accept it. It's not okay. Like you know, and you know where where I was affected was understanding it. it's an idea. It's not anything other than an idea. Your brain is different than my brain. And, you know, some of these people are super high functioning in some areas and some, some areas they can't, you know, do much. But we're all the same human being. We all have the same needs, desires. Like we all are the same person. We all want to be useful. We all want to be valued. We all want to have purpose. We all want to have a community. And, you know, when you say, okay, you're sick, you're never going to get better, take these pills. And by the way, we're not going to hang out with you because you're weird. You're literally giving them a death sentence. Mm. You're putting them off to pasture. And it's like nobody in their right mind understanding mental illness would do that. Mm. Because the idea of mental illness is, hey, we need to pull them in this community. <laughs> we need to get them involved. We need to get them purpose. We need to get them activated. Because how else can we maximize that human being? They're not sick. They're just different. Right. And it's like well, until we start having the conversation of difference and idea, you know, yeah, there's an illness there, but it's a human, you know, malady that can be treated with human interactions. It's not like, you know, my legs falling off. This is literally something where two people can start making progress now just by, hey, you need some help? You look a little down. You want to go for a walk? Like it's so easy to begin the actions, but no one wants to talk about it. Like I talk to people and they're like, I, 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 we can't talk about that. I'm like, why not? You know, we have to talk about it or it's going to become, it's still that, that thing. And then as long as it's that thing, you know, people are going to disparage it and people are going to believe silly things and people are going to spread, you know, rumors and, you know, people are going to, you know, give it what it's been given, hmm. which is a real bad, you know, a bad face. Well, Frank Shamrock, who I've stolen so liberally from <laughs> over the years, no charge for that. <laughs> no, I'll give you full credit from now on. <laughs> Plus minus equal. It's it's actually the greatest learning technique I've ever used for my own self. But all these all these issues we talked about up up and you know, including the, the mental illness, uh, so important, so fascinating to to meet you and and see the arc of how you've sort of transformed yourself again and again to uh, you know to conquer these these battles in your life. An honor to meet you, and I'm so glad you came on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
This Christmas, the NBA is giving you five straight gift-wrapped action-packed games. The Knicks and Bucks tip off the action. Then the Warriors and Nuggets take holiday hoops to new heights. We've got a Christmas classic with Lakers versus Celtics. Then the festivities keep going with the Sixers and Heat. And the Suns and Mavs cap off the night by going missile toe-to-toe. That's why this season's best gift is the gift of games. Don't miss the NBA on Christmas Day on ABC and ESPN. Whether in person or remote, open communication with your doctor is key to managing any condition, including heart failure. How have you been feeling? Um, I'm okay. Both are great options to continue having open conversations with your doctor about how you're feeling. I've had less energy. And when you speak openly with your doctor, they're better equipped to help. Visit heartfailuretalks.com to learn more.